Welcome to CEO Insights. I'm Marilyn de Guzman with Investing News Network. My guest this episode is Alex Holmes, Chief Operating Officer for Nano One Materials. We are talking about the company's new collaboration agreement with Japanese firm Sumitomo Metal Mining. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, so let's get on to it. So your company just announced an agreement with Japanese company Sumitomo, and it includes a $16.9 million strategic investment and a collaborative agreement. Let's parse it down and talk about the financial deal first. Tell us about what that is and what it means for your company's strategic goals. Yes, thank you. This is uh, very exciting news for us today. Um, we're very proud of our team and, and helping us get to this point. Uh, this has been in the works for several months. Uh, with uh, Sumitomo Metal Mining, and um, as a, far as a company goes, um, they're one of the most highly integrated miners, refiners to cathode active materials producer in the world. Um, so this is a this is a significant step forward for Nano One. Uh, the investment itself represents about a five percent equity stake in Nano One. Uh, it was done at about a ten percent premium to the five day VWAP. Um, really, what it is, it's a it's effectively an endorsement, or it's a it's a validation marker of what we are doing at Nano One and what we're looking to continue to do as we uh, execute our, our business plan. Right. And then there's also that collaboration agreement. Uh, uh, is it technical? Like what that, can you talk a bit more about that as well? Yes, it covers the collaboration Europe co- covers a number of areas. Um, so as I mentioned, we spent the last several months uh, working with Sumitomo, but the areas that we're going to be focusing on working with them are ultimately for you know looking to lead to licensing and joint venture of our technology for LFP cathode active materials and NMC cathode active materials. Uh, they are an existing producer today of cathode active materials. They're highly integrated into the Japanese ecosystem. Um, they actually have a very similar plant to the one that we acquired last year in Quebec, and, and theirs is in Vietnam. Uh, and through uh, you know the last number of months. Our teams really were able to sit down, uh, share knowledge and, and the expertise that each other had, in particular in LFP, um, and map out, uh, you know, what is we see as a big opportunity, particularly in the LFP market, but the Japanese market is going to grow in time as well, uh, both for automotive, but also for energy grid storage uh, solutions. So uh, I, I think, uh, I guess a big portion of this uh, agreement comes from your proprietary um, one pot process, right? So for, I guess, investors uh, that are uh, watching us today that's not familiar with that process, could you just give an overview of that uh, process and why that matters to the electric vehicle market and the battery market? Yes, certainly. Uh, so the one pot technology is a technology that we've uh, organically developed ourselves in-house, um, built up over the last uh, 12 years or so, uh, really to a place where now we have 32 patents uh, issued globally, uh, 50 plus pending. And this is about the manufacturing process and how cathode active materials are made. The process in which they're made today is the same way it was made in 1990s. Um, but the system and the process was not designed in the 90s to get to the scales that we're reaching today. So we start to think about net zero 2050. We start to think about electric vehicles on the road, energy grid storage. We're talking about hundreds of terawatts of installed capacity of batteries. And that means tens of millions of tons of cathode active material that goes into those batteries. And the current system today uh, is fairly wasteful. It's not very energy efficient. Uh, It consumes a lot of water. And also has a CO2 footprint as well, which you'd expect. Um, what our technology enables is a much simpler process uh, to produce cathodic materials, call it our one pot technology. It's flexible with different feedstock materials. We have no waste streams. We significantly reduce the amount of water use. Um, we're much more energy efficient. And, uh, and also it's a much lower environmental footprint from a GHG perspective. And you know, you don't always get that as well as capital and operating cost benefits and savings as well. So we've been working up and down the supply chain um, with miners at the far with Rio Tinto, who also owns about 5% of us, uh, all the way through to the cathode active materials producers like BASF and Numacore, big European companies. Now Sumitomo, we add into the mix as a, as a strategic collaborator, uh, down to the cell level with our next energy, where we're working with them 
uh, to uh, ultimately get to offtake for our LFP material that we will produce at a new commercial plant next door to our current one in Quebec. Uh, and then the automotives right down at the end of the supply chain. And the driving force between all of this is localized supply, reducing environmental footprint, improving the cost and the performance of materials. So speaking of um, that supply chain for, you know, battery, um, Canada and Japan have uh, also announced recently enhanced cooperation agreement for a battery supply chain. They haven't really disclosed any details of what those, um, you know, would entail, but what impact do you see that having on your business operations? Well, I think the Canadian government and the Japanese government has spent the last um, a considerable amount of time and efforts. There's been a number of um, missions to Japan. Uh, and earlier this year, we had the um, Battery Association for Supply Chain, which represents the entire battery supply chain in Japan, come to uh, Toronto and also to Montreal. And what we're seeing is, um, you know, a sharing of values, uh, sharing of, um, you know, there's stability in government. Um, there's natural resource extraction that's done responsibly with critical minerals available in Canada. And um, a lot of government will to set up a cleaner, more efficient supply chain. And because of that, and, you know, I think we can't forget that Japan effectively innovated or invented and commercialized the first lithium ion battery um, as, a, as an industry um, it has it pioneered the battery industry. And uh, we've seen massive growth in other regions. And Japan uh, earlier this year announced an industrial policy to build out hundreds of gigawatts of uh, cell manufacturing globally. And so we're starting to see the fruits of that, all the efforts of the government and the private sector that's been working closely with Japanese parties to uh, bring some of these um, partnerships, these collaborations to the forefront. And I think we'll start to see we'll start to see additional ones as well. So a big, I guess, a big market for these these batteries, uh, next generation batteries, is the electric vehicle market, and that's what's driving the demand. I want to get your opinion from a market perspective. Like affordability remains a top issue when it comes to EV adoption, right? Do you view your technology, the one process, and the whole supply chain around that that's happening? as having an impact on that, on addressing that affordability challenge with electric vehicles? I think certainly what our technology uh, addresses is part of that. Um, you know, the cathode active material represents roughly 50% of the cost of a lithium ion cell. And what we've innovated is in the manufacturing process for that. So we're able to use lower cost uh, raw materials. And we've also been able to drive efficiencies to reduce the processing cost and the capital cost. And so taken as a whole, there is an impact ultimately to the, to the, to the end vehicle. Um, there's been other things that have come into play to help with that. Scale is one of them. So certainly economies of scale help drive down costs. Um, innovations in the way uh, cells are put together in packs has also helped. And then, you know, another part of it, which is um, not always understood is there's different chemistries in cath of cathode active materials. You can have iron rich cathode active materials. You can have nickel rich cathode active materials and you can have manganese rich ones. Our technology can make all the major cathode chemistries um, and then some sort of, uh, you know, sort of more unique ones. And one of the cathode materials that we're specifically focused on now for our commercial plants in Quebec is the iron rich cathode material known as LFP. And it has a lot of inherent material benefits. It's a lot safer. It's a lot more stable uh, thermally than high nickel chemistries. It's also a lot lower cost. And the knock against it a couple of years ago was that it was less energy dense than high nickel. However, innovation in what's called cell to pack, where they're able to put more cells within a battery pack that ultimately goes into a vehicle, that has allowed the energy density to become comparable to high nickel. And that's why we're working with a company like Our Next Energy. So if you sort of take a systems approach to it, scale, more efficient processes, innovative technologies, different system designs, all of these things help contribute to get to lower cost EVs. And at the end of the day, there'll be a different use case for each chemistry. We'll have LFP makes a lot of sense for mass market, lower cost electric vehicles, heavy industrial use, 
uh, energy grid storage, and high nickel makes sense for the super high performance long range electric vehicles. And we see a world where you need all of it. Right. Uh, can you talk about now your um, your path and timeline for to commercialization? Like, what uh, can after this, you know, following this big announcement, what can the expect uh, the investor community expect from the company now? Yeah. Sure. So uh, about two weeks ago, we put out um, an update to our shareholders about our activities at our Candiac plant. Um, the key takeaway from that are, are twofold. One is we've now scaled the technology into full commercial scale manufacturing equipment uh, from our lab scale in Burnaby. And we've made repeatable batches that are, that are as good or better than what we've made in the lab. So this to me is uh, massively takes a technology scaling risk off the table. The other thing it allows us to do is start to send out samples to a long list of uh, potential customers. So as we think about A, scaling up production within the existing facility that we have, but B, building a new plant next door on the land that we already own, um, we will need to validate and qualify materials to get offtake to different customers. So our business development and sales team is now going through a process of prioritizing customers uh, based on uh, volume needs, based on timelines, um, to be able to send them samples to start the process to get to full qualification. And from there, with offtake in hand, we'll then have a, one another piece uh, of the equation to be able to start commercial sales, but also to build that new plant. Great. Well, exciting times ahead for the company. Thanks for uh, joining me today and sharing your insights, Alex. Thank you, Marilyn. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Join us again next time for another engaging conversation on CEO Insights. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new updates and interviews from Investing News Network. See you next time.